Muy bien, buenas tardes. Vamos a, a dar inicio a este, este curso. Este curso está enmarcado dentro de una, una de las actividades que estamos obligados, instituciones de eh, Francia, Uruguay, Brasil y nosotros, a realizar. Eh, nosotros presentamos una propuesta, eh, propuesta en la cual el profesor Marcio Sneijer fue un, una contribución muy especial en el marco de un programa francés que se llama Sticamsu. Y bueno, aprobaron la propuesta y en esa, eh, en esa propuesta participaron la Universidad de la República de Uruguay, la Universidad Federal de eh, Florianópolis. Perdón, Santa Catarina de Florianópolis, Sor Schneider, eh, el Instituto Nacional Politécnico de Grenoble, de Grenoble en Francia, y nosotros. ¿no? Entonces, eh, dentro del desarrollo de ese proyecto, como dije al inicio, estamos obligados a desarrollar cierto tipo de actividades, ¿no? y esta es una de ellas. Eh, hemos dado charlas también en Grenoble, porque es parte del proyecto. Dentro de poco, el profesor tiene que ir también a Grenoble para estar en el laboratorio de INPG y seguir avanzando un poco en la propuesta. Eh, es un gusto enorme realmente contar con Marcio. Él es profesor. Su show mío es, es impresionante. Recibió dato y día ingeniería eléctrica por parte de la universidad donde actualmente trabaja por la universidad de Santa Catarina en 1975 y 1980 respectivamente el doctorado lo consiguió en ingeniería eléctrica en la universidad de Sao Paulo en Sao Paulo en 1984 1976 él se unió al departamento de ingeniería eléctrica de la universidad federal de Santa Catarina donde ahora él se desempeña como profesor en 1995. Él estuvo un año eh, en, en el denominado año sabático en el laboratorio de electrónica del famoso Instituto EPFL, Instituto de Tecnología Federal Suizo, en Lausanne. Y entre 1997 y 2001, él fue profesor asociado visitante en la Universidad de Texas A&M en College University. Eh, College Station, perdón, que es la localidad en Estados Unidos. Actualmente eh, sus áreas de investigación de interés son el modelamiento de transistores, circuitos integrados analógicos y eh, detectores de radiación de puerta a flota. En realidad este es un apretado, apretado en eh, el biografía, currículum, eh, y pues para nosotros es un gusto enorme, Marcio, tenerte aquí, y vamos a estar todos los días de esta semana de 3 a 5, habrá un break alrededor de las 4, no olviden que el día jueves hay una conferencia sumamente importante sobre eh, la situación de eh, las, las empresas dedicadas a semiconductores, el nombre exacto es un breve, un breve recuento sobre el desarrollo de los conductores, un tema que está muy caliente, o se ha vuelto caliente el año pasado, especialmente con una cantidad de, de China y Estados Unidos, y hay, hay todos unos detalles que seguramente el lo va a mencionar, con mayor detalle, y también será el día jueves a las cinco y media, será esa conferencia. ¿Eh? Mañana la clase no es aquí, la clase eh, acaba de ser lunes, miércoles, jueves y viernes. Mañana me parece que es aquí al frente, pero es en este ambiente. No sé, ¿Sí? Marcio, te dejamos ah, entonces. Gracias, Isabel. Gracias. Gracias. Bienvenidos. Thank you for coming. Um, I prepared my presentation in English, but uh, we can Spanish? No. I understand a bit, but uh, Mario or Carlos, you want stay here for the whole session but they can help me with the Spanish. If you have questions, mm -hmm. since you are a few students and professors, we can interact in Spanish. 
Or in Portunhol, como se diz. Brasil. Portunhol. Mix de português com espanhol. So feel free to ask me in any language. If I have a problem to understand, I'll ask somebody to translate to English or Portuguese or not to try to do that. Uh, the purpose of my presentation will be what we call the Advanced Compact MOSFET Model and the application to the design and simulation of some basic circuits. I'm going, I'm going to show some very basic circuit, circuits where we can use this simplified or compact model. Uh, what's the motivation for a MOSFET model? You know that what's what's the main device of electronics of our days? MOSFET, right? So one simple circuit today has how many? Maybe 10 billion transistors. And for 2030, it's predicted to have a chip with 1 trillion transistors. 10 to the 12, right? It's a lot of transistors. So why study this MOSFET model? Well, this is the most useful device for electronics. We can make a lot of things with MOSFETs. We can make circuits, we can make sensors, we can make, well, communication, RF circuits, digital circuits, mode processors, well, almost everything, electronics is everything today. Every field needs electronics. So <clears throat> this is a very useful device and it's important to have a model of this device. Uh, how many of you uh, have designed circuits? Any circuits with BJT, diodes, Resistors, capacitors. Yes. So we need a model for the device, right? Oh, what's a resistor? Oh, it's a device that holds the Ohm's law. What's a capacitor? Well, I equals C dV the T. Then for the transistor, it's much more complicated. You have some models today that are useful to interact with the fabrication with the manufacturers. How do you interact with the companies that fabricate the transistors? So you need a model. What's the, <clears throat> the most, no, the, the most uh, famous model of MOSFETs today? Do you know? It's called DSIM. BSIM. BSIM is a model developed by, by the University of California at Berkeley. A group of professors and students, PhD students, master students, since the beginning or the end of the 1980s. So it's the most popular model of MOSFET circuits. But it's very complicated. If you open the model, you see a lot of parameters, maybe a hundred, two hundred, a lot of parameters. So it's not easy to understand the meaning of all the parameters. So uh, we try to create a simple model which represents most of the characteristics of the transistors. So this is not a very simple device because you have to translate the fabrication into a, an electrical model. So if the model is simple and accurate, oh, it will be very useful. So our, my purpose here is to show that, oh, this is really a, a compact model. It's the meaning of compact. It has a few parameters and you can understand the equations that are used to calculate currents, capacitance, and so on. Okay, if you have any question, please, we can interact. <clears throat> 
in English or in Spanish. Okay. Uh, these are the contents of my presentation, a brief introduction. I'll talk first, I'll spend today and maybe part of the session of tomorrow about talking about the mass capacitor. If you understand the mass capacitor, you can understand how the transistor works. After that, uh, I'm going to include a three terminal MOS structure. You have the capacitor and additional, I would say, a contact. In fact, you have two contacts, source and drain, but I'm going to include first just one contact to explain how the physics of the device changes, how the equations change. Then, ah, this presentation is available to you, right? Uh, maybe Mario and maybe you can yeah. you can publish it or I, I don't know how you do it, but you can make it available to everyone here. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, I'm going to talk about the transistor. This is the main pur purpose of my presentation to talk about the transistor and the physical quantities what we call the long channel model. This is the most basic model of the transistor. We call it the long chain model. Okay, or oh, I call it sometimes the 3 p.m. transistor. This model has three parameters to characterize the current versus voltage relationship. Just three parameters. Maybe you know this parameter, the threshold voltage. There is one parameter which is called the specific current, and there is the slope factor. I'm going to talk about these three parameters during my presentation. Then, one of the most basic equations of the model, model, which is the phi charge control model. How the charges are calculated in terms of voltages. You have the transistor is a four terminal device, so you have four voltages. This is not very simple. Okay. In our model, all the voltages are referred to the substrate. Substrate for us is the ground or the reference. After uh, <coughs> talking about this UCCM, I'm going to talk about the UICM, unified current. The idea is for current control model. So after having finished this se se section here, I'll talk about the drain used very low. In fact, I'm going to include just a, another parameter, which will be responsible for a change in the threshold voltage. Okay, it's called the drain used very low. And then, after the inclusion of the fourth parameter, I'm going to talk about the fourth parameter model of the ACM model. Then, the fifth parameter is going to be linked to the saturation, which is the velocity saturation, which is an important parameter, especially for high frequency devices. For low frequency, low voltage, low power devices, this is not an important parameter because this, this velocity saturations is important just for very high electric fields. After the, the inclusion of this phenomenon, we have the 5 pm of five parameters model of the ACM. And then I'm going to talk about transconductances. What which are small signal parameters, and then all the quasi static case uh, and alternating current model. And finally, I will conclude my presentations with the extraction of the basic parameters of the same model. Okay, so using very simple circuit, we will be able to extract the threshold voltage, the slope factor, and so on. Okay, may I go on? Questions? Oh, this is a 
an announcement of publicity of our model. I'm not selling t-shirts here, just to say that uh, this is a, a way to publish our model. Okay. My colleagues, I myself, I forgot my, my shirt at home. <laughs> but maybe next year if I come here again, I can wear it. And uh, this is the, the model. This is a, a, a charge-based model. And this, the front of the shirt is the same model. The back of the shirt is the gunnel pool model of the bipolar transistor. Which is a famous model mm -hmm. as well. Okay, uh, what's a model? Not just a simple, only a compact model, but any model, especially for integrated circuits, is the medium of information exchange between the manufacturer and the designer. How do we communicate? We need a model for the devices that we are going to use. Okay. And that we have some, we need detailed information. <laughs> we need information about parasitic components, about the basic model of the transistor, the basic model of a resistor, a capacitor. We need the models because our language is the electrical language. It's electric parameters. So this is very important for designing and simulation. We have to understand what we are doing. Okay. For the case of simulators, it, it should be very interesting to have simple models to characterize the device and simple and accurate at the same time. This is not an easy task. Sometimes many simulators or many models use several parameters which try to make a mathematical fitting. It's just like a table. You look at, at the characteristic of the component and you try to, well, let's make a lookup table, how they call, which gives the information mm -hmm. about the characteristics of the device. Well, this is a bit. But in our case, we, we want expressions, we want details about the equations that are associated with the physical behavior of the device. It's important that the model must be physics, derived from physics, because this, this gives the the portability of the model. You can change from one, one technology to the other by keeping the same equations, but just giving or <coughs> providing the model with different parameters. But the equations should be the same once the devices are based on the same materials, on the same processing of materials and the same physics. This is an interesting way of seeing the things. <clears throat> On this side, you, you, we have the oversimplified model. I'm going to use the, the board here. May I move this? I guess so. Hey, Carlos. Come Don't on, you allow me. Uh, I'm going back to the undergrad course, okay? Do you, I'm going to write the equation of the brain current of transistor. Can you give me some clues to write this? Okay. Is that correct? What's this K here? Depends on the mobility, right? The capacitance. 
the oxide capacitance, the oxide capacitance per unit area, and the, 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 the length and width of the yes, uh, right. gate. Maybe there is a factor of two here. I don't remember, does it? Well, you have, in this equation, you have these parameters, mobility, Cox, the, the oxide capacitance, the geometry, let's say the geometry, width mm -hmm. and mass, and there is another parameter here. This is a very simple model, okay? It's a parabolic model mm -hmm. in the equation IB versus EGS, something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. If the VGS equals VT, you have ID equal to zero, right? This is a lie. This is not true. The behavior of this trans the transistor is not like this. If you change the current scaling, you have something here. Say this is milliamps. Now I'm going to watch the current set, the microamp. Can you see something? So this equation is very simplified, but doesn't tell the truth about the transistor. Transistor is a different device. If it's like in the bi bipolar or the diode. Diode is not just a, a simple curve like, oh, if V is less than zero, I equal to zero. If I equal, uh, if I is finite, V equals zero. This is the ideal transistor. <clears throat> this equation is an oversimplified equation. Now let's move to the other side of the bridge. You have here a model such as BSIM, but BSIM has a lot of equations just for the I versus V characteristic, the dependence of the current on the voltage. So you have maybe tens or hundreds of parameters. So, but this is very complicated to understand. Our goal is to put something in here between these two models, between the very simple model, which is not useful for Many, many applications. For, a, for example, for biomedical applications, you need very, very low currents, very, very low voltage. You cannot, with this model, say, bias the transistor is voltage less than 0.5 volt, less than VT. So let's build something here which Reaches these two models, the oversimplified or the highly sophisticated model. Okay, so this is like the sim, this is like the quadratic model, and you need something in between to meet these two types of models. Okay, so the purpose of my visit here is to show something about this model that leads these two limits, the oversimplified and the very complicated model. Okay, so let's let's move on. This is here our model. So this is design oriented model, which we call. ACM2, this is a second version of the model. So you see that for DC characteristics of the device, we will we'll have five DC parameters. Oh. Okay. Let's move to our bridge. Well, what's a compact model? You know that. Design a circuit with some models, but what's the model? The model is a representation 
of the device, say this is a transistor. So and what is the transistor? No, the transistor is a, is a collection or is a series of processing steps, sometimes 100, 150 steps to build a transistor. So, it's something that represents the transistor and the physics and the processing of this device. <laughs> so that's, I'm going to develop a transistor from, from the very basic, from the very basic principles of a capacitor, a capacitor, okay? So the transistor is essentially a capacitor where you control the carriers under the gate and apply a voltage difference to create the current. <coughs> okay, my presentation will be about the five, the end of five parameters of the ACM model. I'm going to talk about the small signal model. But I'm not going to talk about noise and mismatch. I eliminated these two um, <coughs> sections because it would be a very heavy course. Okay, I, I, I want it to be lighter. Let's say not, I'm, I will not include these two topics, but these are very important because they, these are essentially the physics or the problems that limit the applications of noise. You know, noise is important because noise limits the lowest level of the signal that can be applied to the device. This match, this match is the difference between two supposed identical devices. So matching or mismatch is one of the most important problems for scaling of devices. This is very critical for advanced technologies because in advanced technology, the dimensions are very small and any difference in the number of atoms between two devices can be a, a chaos for the, the correct behavior of the circuit. Okay, so this is essential for, especially for scale of the technology. Well, what are the basic parameters on, in our model? We have five parameters plus these two geometrical parameters, width and length, like here. So you have five parameters in our technology. It, which is which are called the specific current. Okay. It's like in the diode. The diode is the basic PN junction diode is characterized by the Shockley equation. And in Shockley equation, you have a, an IS, the reverse current, saturation current. You have something. Well, it doesn't have the same meaning, but it's similar. Need a specific current to characterize your device. Then you have the threshold voltage. In our model, we have only a single threshold voltage, which is not affected by the source voltage or the drain voltage. In the classical textbook models, you have something here in this VT, which is say Vt0 plus a factor, no, this is not the case in our model. We don't use this approximation, okay? In our model, the substrate is the reference. In this classical model, the reference is the source of the transistor, no. We just want to have one single reference, the bulk, the substrate. Because the transistor is a symmetrical device. <clears throat> so if you make something like this, you destroy the symmetry of the device. It's no longer symmetrical. Okay? So let's keep the symmetry of our device. You have the slope factor. Now, oh, this is similar 
to the n factoring the diode equation, which is the noid ideality factor. I would say it's similar, but it has a different definition, of course, because it's a definition which depends on the parameter of the MOSFET. This is called the Debole coefficient, grain induced barrier low coefficients. And zeta is a parameter which is connected to the velocity saturation of the device. So these are the five parameters. I'm going to show what is the origin of this parameter. Okay, so let's move. This is a, I would say, a small list of parameters. In our case, they are not, oh, it's not a long list. I think it seems the list is much longer, maybe like the 200 parameters or something similar. Ah, you know that. Okay, you have uh, first the mobility, the oxide capacitance, the oxide phases, and so on. <laughs> and a pinch of voltage, I'm going to explain what it is. The thermal voltage which is the same as in the bipolar transistor in the diode, which is 25.9 millivolts at room temperature. You know, these parameters is linked to heat, to thermal motion. So this is a common parameter for the devices we usually work with, diodes, trans bipolar transistors, or MOSFET. I would say this parameter is associated with a phenomenon called diffusion. This is the origin of it. Or diffusion is associated with thermal energy. Energia thermica. See? Transconductance. The, the MOSFET has five, trans, four transconductors. Each one is associated with a terminal. Four terminals, four transconductors. This is a called a channel linearity factor. I'm going to explain later. Charges, charges associated with the channel, which we call inversion charge. Because why inversion charge? Because in a say, it, uh, an NMOS transistor, the carriers are electrons. But the substrate is a p-type substrate, and the majority carries are holes. So you have to invert the substrate to have a channel which is which connects the drain source. Okay. If this is the bulk charge QB. Bulk charge means the ion charge. You have two types of charges in a semiconductor. The carriers, electrons, holes, electrones, the wecos, and ions, ions, ions. This is also this charge associated ions, ions. The gate charge, the charge at the gate. <laughs> this is a problem here. Drain charge and sort charge. Because how do we split the channel charge? The channel charge is composed of two charges. One is associated with the source, and the other with the drain. Oh, this is something mysterious. How do you associate the charge? Oh, this problem was solved in the 1990s, I suppose, in the beginning of the 1990s by a group of Stanford University. Because before this partition, the models didn't conserve charge. If you don't do this correctly, the model will not conserve charge. What does it mean? The charge will appear or disappear without explanation, okay? 
Uh, okay. I'm going to normalize charge. Everything will be normalized here. We'll, we'll uh, talk about normalize the quantities. Our dimensionless numbers refer to a certain reference. Okay. Capacitance and so on. Okay, so. See, excuse me, in the previous slide, the previous slide, one, mm -hmm. um, ahí viste uh, el sí. de Terrell Cross voltage, ¿no? O sea, voltaje de umbral. Sí, exacto, voltaje de umbral. He observado que en algunos microprocesadores usados para redes neuronales, sí. es vital ese valor. Sí, para. Quería hacerles la consulta. Por eso en el siguiente slide, cuando ya veíamos. No el threshold voltage, sino el, el mínimo, ¿no? Que es eh, el otro valor. ¿Qué tan importante usted ha observado que es eso en el diseño mismo the, the, del MOSFET? En el diseño, sí. Yes. Ok. Uh, for neural networks, you generally need very low power because you need a lot of process, processing, right? So... Uh, if you have a very high voltage, it's difficult to turn on the transistor, let's say. I'm going to explain this later. But if you have very, very low threshold voltage, you have a high leakage current. And this is not useful for neural network because you need very, very small leakage currents, say maybe the less than the femtoamp range. But, so you have to choose convenient, convenient <laughs> values of the threshold voltage. I can give you the, the example here. Let's put this here in a log scale of currency. This is log of ID. For two different threshold voltages. Here you have, say, this threshold voltage is very low, say, 200 millivolts, and this one, say, 400 millivolts. You see that the curves are almost the same, let's say. That's a scaling factor between the two. But in this case, if you go to zero, if you make VGS equal to zero, you have a very small, say, 10 to minus 15 amps here. And this one, if VGS equals zero, you want to turn off the transistor, but this will be, say, that 10 to minus 10. So you have a very large range of currents if you change the threshold voltage. So this is a very important, good, interesting question. Especially, oh, for I would say for any kind of circuit, circuit where the low current or low power is a must. Okay, I don't know if I answered your question, but and the in, in current technologies, you generally have transistors with different flavors, I would say. One of them can be, uh, can have a threshold voltage of 500 millivolts. This would be, a, say, a standard transistor. There are transistors which are called zero VT transistor or native transistors in which the threshold voltage is very low. Let's say, oh, these are not useful for very low power devices, but, they are useful for some applications, okay? And you have, in general, you have three or four types of transistors with different, you have the IOs, which are required to interface with uh, other uh, circuits, with other printed circuits. So this transistor in general, they, ha they have to 
support something like 3.3 volts or 5 volts. And in general, they have thicker oxides and they have higher threshold volts. So in, in current technology, you have a lot of, I would say, several flavors of transistors in which you can choose according to your application. Any other question? I'm not in a hurry here. I, I have all the time. Uh, I will spend all the the whole week with with you, and so you can ask me any any time. Second question. Eh, en otro caso, en los LNA, low noise of here, he observado que además del MOSFET hay galio y arsenio. Sí. Eh, ¿Cuál? Galio, galio arsenide. Arsenide. You know, arsenide. Yes, because they are faster. You need for radio frequencies, higher frequencies, you need basically the, the difference is here. This is the modulus of galio arsenide transistor is much higher than me. But nowadays, nowadays, the MOS technology has developed so much that the transistors of our uh, of nowadays are, I would say, as fast as the arsenide device. So you use CMOS technology for RF for very, very high frequency. They are competing with bipolars as well. And gallium arsenide, yes, has its, its niche of applications, but uh, CMOS is is there also. Okay. Yes. Gallium arsenide has a problem. You don't have a good PMOS transistors, complementary transistor for any. So it's much more difficult to build digital devices. Because in a CMOS, in the CMOS technology, you, you have the NMOS and the complementary of the NMOS, the PMOS. So you can completely turn off a device with a high or a low uh, input level. Okay. Okay, this is the capacitor I'm going to talk about now. The, the MOS capacitor. It's a three-layer device. You have a the gate. The gate is metal or polysilicon. A polysilicon is silicon, highly doped silicon. Yes. Let's say like a metal, almost like. <laughs> it's not exactly a metal, but it's an interesting device for, for the gate. You have a thin outside. Uh, in scale the technology in other technology, the material is different. It's not exactly silicon side. But let's say for us it will be silicon. The substrate or the bulk. In our case, I'm going to study P type of the silicon. You know that this device is the majority carry is the whole. The minority carry is the electron. Okay? Also, the key type substrate is going to be considered now <laughs> for the for building the NMOS transistor. Okay? okay during this presentation, the vertical axis will be the denoted by x, okay? This direction is the x axis. This one will be the y axis. It's not the conventional uh, notation, but I follow the presentation of most of the textbooks, okay? Here's the gate. 
the oxide and the substrate. You know, this is the equation of a capacitor. You have a parallel plate capacitor. And the difference between this voltage and this voltage, phi s, phi s means the voltage at the interface, the voltage in the substrate at the interface. So you have a two plate capacitor, parallel plate capacitor. The top plate is biased at VG, and the bottom plate, this is the interface between the substrate and the oxide. And this voltage here is phi S. Okay. So the, the voltage difference. Divide of the voltage difference multiplied by the oxide capacitance gives the gate capacity, the gate charge. A note here: this is this is not charge. This is charge per unit area, kilo per square meter. And this is capacitance. Per Okay. For the design of integrated circuits, we don't use absolute values. In general, we use densities. Instead of charges, we use charge per unit area. It means charge density. Okay. It's, it's an aerial charge density. It's not the volumetric charge density. I'm going to differentiate the, the two uh, densities in, a, in one of the next slides. So what's the outside capacitance? You know that the formula for a capacitance, parallel plate capacitor is into epsilon, the permittivity of the Material, the outside. This is. Let's move this A here. And I'm defined on a new oxide capacitance per unit area, which is epsilon over, in this case, the distance between the two plates is A. So this epsilon over A is the oxide capacitance per unit area. And Eg, Qg is the charge density or charge per unit area. Okay? So this is a simple equation of a, a fam the famous parallel plate capacitor. Any questions here? <clears throat> I'm going to change a bit this equation because, in general, we are interested by the semiconductor charge instead of the gate charge. I want to, to, to know what, what's going to happen here at the semiconductor, not at the gate. So I'm going to change this equation. Instead of the gate capacitance here, I have the substrate capacitance. Just using charge conservation principle. You know that the charge that appears here has an image here, which is the opposite charge. Okay, so I'm going to write this equation, which is called the charge balance equation. This, okay, sorry, the potential balance equation using this formulation here, in which I replace the QG by the ES. Okay, so the equation is the same. Uh, you have the parameters here, and this parameter is associated with the substrate concentration, which is given in acceptors per 
cubic centimeter. Okay? This is a volumetric acceptor density. Typically, this is 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter. Typical values are around this. Okay. Uh, well, this is the profile of the carriers in the substrate. Let's assume that Vg equals zero. Okay. So you do not affect the charges in the substrate. When Vg equal to zero is it's like, oh, I don't have the gate, I just have the substrate. I'm not affecting the charge in the substrate. So the charges in the substrate are P and N. P is the whole density, volumetric density P. Holds per centimeter and is electrons per centimeter. Okay. In the semiconductor, you know that the in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, the product Pn equals Ni squared. In the case of silicon, Ni at room temperature. Is around 10 to the 10 per cubic Okay, let's assume that Na is 10 to the 16. And this is almost almost equal to P, the whole concentration. Then N equals 10 to the 4. Per cubic centimeter. This product equals to n i squared. You know that n i is called the intrinsic concentration. What's the intrinsic concentration? It's the concentration of a pure silicon, the silicon without doping, just silicon material. Okay. When you dope the silicon, you change the concentration. In this case. So in a log scale, you would have 10 to 16 here, or 16, and 4 here. Right. Let's say that this is a, a scale in a log scale, log 10 scale. In general, I'm going to present the concentrations in a log scale. Because if you put this as a linear scale, n will disappear. You don't know where is n. When you compare this number with this one, this is nothing. The linear scale is zero. I'm always interested in this concentration. Because this is fundamental for the behavior of the most consistent. Any question here? Okay, this equation now has to be modified by the inclusion of a, a parameter. This parameter is called the flat band voltage. So, so you have to modify this equation because you have different materials for the gate and for the substrate. There is what we call a contact potential. When you contact two different materials, you have a potential contact. Okay. Oh, but materials, one is here and the other is there. But you have some connection here, right? Let's say that you have included a battery here. The battery is connected to VG, the positive terminal of the battery, the negative terminal is connected here. So you have contacts between this gate and this material here, say aluminum. Another aluminum here, okay? But the aluminum doesn't play any role here because it has a contact here and contact here. 
<laughs> the effect of the alumnum is eliminated. You have the effect only of the material and this material. And another problem is the MOSFET capacitor, or the MOS capacitor, is that due to the fabrication process, some ions are in the oxide. Mm -hmm. So the effect of this ions must be accounted for in this equation. So this is a, just a modified equation. You see here, the VFB is just a, fill, a shift in the basic equation of a capacitor. So let's read that formulas as the equation of a parallel plate capacitor with a modification or a shift <coughs> due to the flat band voltage. What's the flat band voltage, the meaning of the flat band voltage? If you apply a voltage equal to flat band, you cancel out the, the left side of the equation, so you cancel out the, also the right side of the equation. In this case, phi s will be equal to zero, and the concentrations of holes and electrons will be as in this diagram here, okay? So, in our case, I'm going to talk about this structure. I'm going to ignore this flat band voltage. Let's assume that it's zero. It's, it's simpler to talk about this device, assuming that flat band voltage is zero. Just, I'm going to put this in my brain. Let's assume that the flat band voltage is zero. So, it will be easier for me to talk about this device, okay? Let's make a break. 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, am I uh, am I going very quick or how the comprendes bien? Si no comprendes, preguntas. no 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 Então, é, 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 é
Es que yo no iba a dejar el tema. La va a facilitar hacer el plan. Ah, porque te impulsa el Fazemos a No, pero sí, tiene también Ingeniería Gracias. <laughs> <laughs>
Sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí. Sí, sí. Sí, sí. Você deve ter usado Eu não sei, porque teve que fazer um Usar um compact model da ASU Para fazer um negócio Eu tenho que comprar 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 para o que você fez com o Você para dos? Para el péndulo invertido. 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 Para el péndulo a partir disso, foi mais que se passava e ai, foi isso. Mas você fazia aquelas estruturas fechadas, por exemplo, nas estrelas? Sem caminho, também para não fazia a moça. Então, apenas foi estar o transistor com o óxido enterrado embaixo do canal. E fazia um trabalho muito mais empobrecido a concentração do pagem dentro do canal. Y el león que le diga la una vez que lo usaba 16, no sabe. Sí, pero era como un arco de campo, tipo así. Eh, Axo de espeso. Y me hizo de la ventena, ¿no? No, no, no. Se describe la ventena, no, porque fue o menor, 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 Nicolás fue a la última. Sí, se pasó a usar con el último óxido de campo, es el STI. El óxido de campo. Pero, STI. Tengo que abandonar otra tecnología, locos, porque tenían problemas con los bicos de pasarlo. Esta cosa es muy tarde en las puntas. Por eso la pasaría la idea de los óxidos de campo, supuestamente lo que está a usted. Sí, sí, sí. Hay que mudar el VT en la transición. Sí, pero el archivo se fue a una tornería, se fue a una tornería. Sí, 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 sí
você que irradiava os dispositivos? Não, eu irradiava, mas em simulação de um central. Ah, eu não sei se eu tinha algum, alguém que fazia irradiação? Não, não, não. Eu tinha essa sorte de ter um chip e um de levar para a Universidade de São Paulo. Sim, eu tenho um aluno meu que está trabalhando em Portugal que usa o banco de sonda é melhor para fazer isso. O problema é a gama, tem muita coisa, tem que ver um jeito para que não A gama tem um problema com os silêncios. Quando se estraga, o gama estraga a rede cristalina. Ah, porque é muito energético. É isso. É, 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 começa a criar um monte de defeitos. Mas o que eu não sei se 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 eu não sei não sei se eu 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 Ah, <laughs> Isso, isso você fez em 2015. Vamos começar em seguida? Não me abandono. Vamos continuar, então, vocês... Uh, very good example, just to check some values. This this uh, example, we calculate the oxide capacitance per unit area for oxide thickness of 520 nanometers. Permittivity of silicon oxide is of four times the permittivity of the free space. Oh, mm -hmm. it is if you free space. Huh? Okay, the, the for the five nanometer high thickness, you have a, a oxide capacitance of about seven hundred nanometers per square centimeter. Mm -hmm. This just uh, Note about. Let's say that you have a chip of one square centimeter. So the capacitance that you can build with this chip is seven hundred nanofarads. So this 
The usual values of capacitors for integrated circuits are maximum in the peak of current range. Otherwise, you, you will spend a lot of area. Okay. Of course, if the oxide thickness is four times greater, you have an oxide capacitor which is four times less. To include a one peak of Farad capacitor, you would need an area of 145 micrometer squared. So this would be around for one peak of Farad capacitor, let's say around 12 by 12. Approximate. Okay. Mm -hmm. This for, um, for a one gigabyte. Now, the gate charge per unit area in kilo per square centimeters or VG minus CS equal to one volt. Okay. Just to put the hours here. Minus Ps times Cox equals E to S. For the semiconductor capacitors in this case would be for the first case 0.7 times 10 to the minus 6 to per square centimeter. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. find you detail. Now, a uh, second important concept is about the volumetric and aero chart densities. This is a, a layer of charge. You have an electron concentration of 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter. The dimensions are one big micrometer for L and W and uh, a thickness of 0.1 micrometer. Assume that this is like a table here. And I'm going to see this table from the top, right? So, uh, First case, calculate the problem charge density. The charge density is coulomb per cubic centimeter. So we have to calculate the number of coulombs in this layer. So you just multiply. You know that the elect electron charge is minus 1.6. Then to the minus 19 coulombs. So calculate the volumetric charge density. The symbol is rho. We have minus Q times N. So minus 1.6 10 to the minus 19 times 10 to 16. So the result is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs per cubic centimeter, right? What's the number of the electrons in this box? This is simple, just multiply the density of the electrons by the volume. So you convert the units, so it's a small number. But this is very real in a MOSFET. Number of electrons, the number of carriers usually is very, very low. Well, and the other result is important here is when you see from the top, so the charge density is the aerial, Density. So you you have the total number of electrons and you divide by the, the area. So you have a 
the aerial density of electrons and multiplied by the electron charge, you have this number here. You see that this is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8 coulombs per square centimeter. This is just the total number of electrons times the charge, the electronic charge, divided by the area seen from the top, divided by the product W versus L. So we have this number here. Qn equals minus Qn oh, times T, total charge times T this gives you minus 1.6 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the 16 times how much? What's the value of T is? Point one, ah. micron, ten to the minus four. Yes. The conversion to from micron to centimeter is ten to the minus four. One centimeter is. 10 millimeters with then one millimeter is 10 to the three micrometers. So you can also calculate this value taking the total charge and divided by the area seen from the top, which is equivalent to this calcul this calculation here. They are equivalent. Why is this so important? Because when the designer they don't they don't design the vertical dimensions of the transistor. What they, desi they, they design is W and L. It's the top view of it. It's like the floor plan of a house. When you see the floor plan of a house, you see the house from the top. And you see, let's say, the number of tiles per square meter, for example. Here we see the number of electrons or the number of coulombs per square centimeter, which is equivalent to the, the tiles in a house. See what's a tile, right? It's like a, it's like a square when you put on the floor. That you put on the floor. Do, do you have any question here? May I move to the next? Please ask any anything. If not, it's not clear. I can I can answer. No, no question. But... Okay. So let's move to the most. As mass capacitor. Well, uh, let's talk about semiconductors again. Okay. In a semiconductor, you have four types of charges. Let's say holes, positive charge, electrons. Holes are positive, electrons negative. These, these two types of charges are what we call carriers. They can carry the current. They can move along the crystal, along the silicon crystal. But you have two other types of charges, the fixed charge. Say, a donor. What's a donor? Do you remember what a donor is? It's a pentavalent atom with five electrons in the outermost shell. 
when one of these electrons is lost, you have four electrons, but a positive charge is remain, remains there. So you have the creation of an ion when a donor atom is included in the silicon crystal. Do you remember about this concept? A pentavalent atom loses an electron, it becomes an ion. What's the difference between an ion and a carrot? An ion cannot move along the crystal. It's, so, it's there, it cannot move, okay? Mm -hmm. So, donor atoms are converted, they lose electrons, so they are converted into positive ions. Mm -hmm. The acceptor atoms gain an electron, they, they lose a hole, okay? They are converted into negative ions. Mm -hmm. In our case, let us suppose that the substrate is doped with acceptor atoms only. You have no donors, that's the reason why I made a cross on the donor atoms. So I have three types of charges here, carriers and ion. So, so the semiconductor charge is composed of these three types of charge, or it's the integral of the volumetric density of charge along the volume. This PUS is charge per unit area. So the reason this is volumetric charge density, which is integrated along the x-axis. So this is charge per unit area. So this charge is composed of positive charges, heat charge, and negative charges, okay? So I'm going to make a distinction between these charges here. The charge that interests me are the electron charges. So I'm going to call these charges inversion charge density. Why inversion? Because the substrate is P, and I want to invert the substrate to create negative charges, or to increase the amount of negative charge. So this is called the inversion charge density. So, and the remaining charge, the remaining charge, which is the combination of the whole charge and the ion charge is called the bulk charge. Okay, so I make a distinction between two types of charge, the inversion charge density, which will be, will give rise to the current, and this other one, which is also necessary, because when you solve the semiconductor equations, you have to consider both types of charge, right? Okay, so QI is modal charge, and the other is both fixed charge. In general, I'm going to consider a region where the effect of the peak, the holes is negative, okay? Or better, better say that the, the holes are not important for the current, because in the MOSFET, we are going to include two other terminals, which are drain and source, and these two terms are rich in electrons, but they don't have, or they vary, they have a very small amount of holes, okay? So, in this, in this picture, we are uh, separating the, the two types of charge, bulk charge and inverted charge. Okay, let's uh, define regions of operation of the MOS capacitor. Okay, for practical purposes, 
let's assume that the flat band voltage is zero. So this is like a parallel plate capacitor. And to begin with, let's assume that VGB is negative. Okay? So VGB is less than zero. In this case, you have a negative charge on the gate and a positive charge on the substrate. What happens here? The negative charge of the gate creates a field which attracts positive charge very close to the interface. Okay? This is a charge of uh, holes, positive charge, right? So this region is called accumulation region. The holes accumulate very close to the interface. The behavior of this structure in these regions is almost like that of a parallel plate capacitor. Because the holes accumulate very close to the interface. It's like a metal. You know that in a metal, if you have a metal here, the charge accumulates just very close to the interface with the outside, right? <clears throat> so the diagram of volumetric charge density, electric field potential is like this here. Wow. What is the role? Volumetric charge density since the charge concentrates in a very thin region close to the outside. You represented it as an impulse function. Okay, it's concentrated a very thin distance from the outside. Okay, and uh, well, you have the, the image here, the, ima the image of holes, which is also a direct function, impulse function. Okay. There is an electric field along the oxide. The electric field is constant. It's like that in a parallel plate capacitor. Okay. We have a constant electric field. Indeed. So you have a linear variation of the potential. Okay. This uh, electric field from this <laughs> concentration and the Voltage from the electric field, you just have two integrals. You have to solve two integrals with the appropriate boundary conditions because you have to solve Poisson's equation, right? Just to, to remind you about the Poisson's equation, right? So, equals V, Vx, or Question, huh? So what happens here in the substrate? <laughs> so you have modified the concentration of holes very close to the interface. Something like this here. This is the equilibrium concentration when the, the gate voltage is zero. Now you, you have applied a negative gate voltage, you attract holes very close to the interface, the concentration of holes has increased. At the same time, since the product of Q, P, and N must, must be constant equal to Ni squared, the concentration of electrons is reduced. So the product Pn equals Ni squared. Since this is a log scale, the geometric Converted in a log scale this full log in so the geometric average is converted into a geometric in a mathematical average, right? Because I'm using a log scale to represent the concentrations of holes and electrons. 
say if this value here is 10 to 19, this one here will be 10 to 1. Because the product is must be there equal to n i squared, which is 10 to 20. Right? Is that clear? <laughs> we call this semiconductor in thermal equili equilibrium because there is no current here, right? You have an oxide, and I'm assuming that the oxide is such that it's not very thin. If this oxide is very, very thin, a current can be through the oxide by the tunneling effect. I'm not continuing the tunneling effect here, right? So the product of holes and the like concentration equals n i squared. This is a law that I didn't know okay. before, but this is called the Bo Bo Boltzmann law. The Boltzmann law gives the distribution of holes and electrons in terms of the electric potential. I suppose that you are familiar. This is similar to what happens in a diode, diode junction, uh, a, a PN junction. Uh, probably you know this from the Shockley equation of the diode, okay? But the, the statistical distribution here and in this diode equations is the same, are the same. Any questions here? May I, may I go on? Okay, let's move to another region. It's called the depletion region. Assuming that the gate to bulk voltage now is say slightly higher than zero, 100 millivolts. In this case, <laughs> what happens is that the electric field repels the holes from the proximity of the outside. And since it, the holes are removed, the, the charge that remains here is the ionic charge of the acceptors. We call that the acceptor atom is an atom with three electrons in the outermost shell. When it receives one electron, it becomes a negative ion. And what about the holes which are close to these ions? They are removed by the action of the electro field created by this voltage difference. So it's created here a depletion zone. That's why this region is called the depletion region of the MOSCAT. What about the electrons? Do you have electrons here? Yes, we have, but they, they are in a very small amount. Let's move to this picture here. So this is the original concentration of holes, the original concentration of electrons when the gate to bulk voltage is zero. Now that you have applied a small <laughs> voltage, you decrease the number of holes, you remove the holes from the proximity of the interface with the oxide, but at the same time, electrons are attracted. So you have something like this, a decrease of holes and an increase of electrons. But this is in a large scale. I'm going to put now this, this modification of the concentration in a linear scale. Okay, this is the interface. In a linear scale, you have something like this. The whole concentration is equal to Na. And then finally, it increases 
a lot. If you put this in a linear scale, it's going to appear something like this. The amount of electrons is still very, very small. Let's say this is 10 to 16. Let's say here is 10 to 12. This would be 10 to 8. So this, uh, this amount is very small compared to this one. Okay, but the variation of the, the P of the whole concentration in a linear scale, now it's not log of P, but P is something like this. And from this profile, I see that, well, I can approximate this profile by what we call an abrupt profile, something like this. Okay, this is called the depletion approximation. So I can make simple uh, calculus, calculations here because this is a very simple profile where I can calculate the volumetric charge density here and I can say that this is equal to minus Q and A. You can say that this is zero and you have a profile like this. So this is the approximation that is very, very useful for calculating semiconductor devices. We use this approximation for the PN junction, for the bipolar transistor, for the MOS capacitor. I would say, well, why do we, do we need this kind of approximation? Because it gives very simple results. You have, with a formulation like this, you have an explicit function of the doping. You can calculate everything here because the equations become very simple. For example, Poisson's equation, you have a, a constant volumetric charge density. So if this is constant, this is a linear. It's a linear function. And if the field is a linear function of x, then the potential is a quadratic function of x. So this, this kind of approximation is really important because you have compact result, and you have uh, a formulation of how the parameters change in terms of the doping concentration, okay? I'm not going through this again, but it's important for you. Probably you have already used this approximation when you calculated the I to V relationship in a diode. So oh, the, the approximation is similar here. What happens if we keep on increasing the gate voltage? Well, more holes are sent away from the interface and more electrons are attracted. Holes moved out of the interface and electrons are attracted. Okay, and you have something like this. Okay. And in this picture here, you have the electron concentration and the whole concentration at the interface equal in I. Okay. At this point, we say that the MOS cap becomes inverted. Because at the interface, or close to the interface, the electrons become majority carriers, and the holes become minority carriers. Okay, so this is a very important definition that is used for calculations of threshold holes. So let's calculate what happens here. So you have in our equation, The electron concentration, the whole concentration, are given by these two expressions, exponential of phi over phi, and P equals P. 
P0 exponential minus phi over phi t. This is the Boltzmann distribution of electrons and holes. Okay? In, in our case, the value of the whole concentration equals Na when phi equal to zero. That is, S is it, the condition that you see when you don't see the gate. Phi equal to zero. Let's say that the voltage difference VGB equals zero. Okay? And this in, in zero is equal to n i squared over n t. Okay, so under this condition, you have p equal to n equal to n i. So you just put these numbers here. Let's say Ni here equal to Na exponential. The potential here is called the surface potential. It's the potential interface. So the potential at this point is is five s. Okay. Okay, phi is the generic potential along the x-axis. Phi s is the potential at the interface. You mean, uh, professor, uh, the function that uh, defines, no, that is defined there, no, the function statistic that defines. Ah, see the bot, bot. How tanto podría aproximarse a cuando, por ejemplo, yo quiero censar gas o en, Gases, una memoria de, sí. o en una memoria flash, ¿no? Porque ahí usted sabe que depende mucho la relación de la función para detectar, para, por el óxido, ¿no? O sea, para, para ver si, si dispara o no dispara o almacena o no almacena en memoria flash, ¿no? ¿Influye o no influye, profesores? ¿Tiene memoria que flash? Sí. En memoria flash... Usted tiene un fenómeno que se llama el tunelamiento, ¿no? Entonces, pero esta ecuación es diferente Ay. para memoria flash. You have a dependence of, tienes una dependencia con el electric field que es applied. Si el electric, o si el electric, el campo eléctrico es, es bajo, tú no consigues sí, grabar la memoria. Yeah. Okay. Pero es también una función exponencial, okay. también, okay. pero es diferente. Okay. Okay. diferente. ¿Y la de gas? Eh. ¿Los sensores de gas? Sensores, bueno, sensores de gas, bueno, que hay sensores capacitivos, hay sensores, sensores resistivos, pero es un poco diferente. Creo que le, en un sensor de gas o, o gas altera las propiedades físicas de acuerdo con, con otras formulaciones. Creo que es un poco diferente. Tú puedes, puedes pensar en un resistor que, por, por ejemplo, que el gas como que humedece el resistor y le altera conductividad. Un poco mecanismos diferentes. Pero tal vez uh, haga algún mecanismo de tipo exponencial también. Pero no lo sé si la, 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 las ecuaciones son similares. ¿Ok? Porque dada la función, se presta, ya que es exponencial, se presta para poder aplicar sí, superposición. Sí, esta exponencial es muy general, pero claro. que para estudiar gases... Viene de la teoría de la termodinámica para el estudio de, de gases, cómo se distribuyen, como en una atmósfera, con un cierto volumen, cómo, es, cómo varía la velocidad de, de, de la energía cinética que está ligada a la temperatura. Es una ley muy general de, de esto de movimiento browniano. Que fue descrito por Einstein en 1905. En 19.05. Es una ley muy general. Pero 
En en este caso de, de los cargos, creo que son mecanismos distintos en general para sensores. Y hay sensores que de, de números, sensores capacitivos, resistivos y otros más. Eh, la pregunta se me ocurrió porque en la anterior diapositiva, en el previous slide, eh, usted hace una simplificación. Ah, hay una simplificación. No sé sí, si hay... sí, la, la, la simplific... región de depresión que Pero asume es... que no hay portadores, que yeah. no hay iones. ¿Es válido? ¿Hasta qué punto es válido? Eso? No, no es completamente válido. Pero cuando, cuando se compara la región de depresión calculada según la aproximación y, y con, con la solución numérica, en muchos casos son prácticamente iguales. Sí. Un, un, uno de mi, mi, mis estudiantes ha aplotado la solución numérica del diodo, por ejemplo, que, que es regido por una ecuación como esta. Y la aproximación numérica, bueno, no siempre es muy parecida con la aproximación de presión, pero los resultados, si tienes un resultado explícito en términos de de, de comprimentos, de dopajes y de dopajes. Es mucho mejor porque consigues verificar cuáles son los factores que intervienen, intervienen en, estos, en estas características. Si tienes un resultado numérico, tienes que simular cada caso. Si, ah, si varias un parámetro, ¿qué, ¿qué sucede? ¿Qué sucede? Pero si tienes un una formulación aproximada, pero es mucho mejor. ¿Ok? Muy mejor. Gracias. Pero en this case, en this case, when you have the concentrations of holes and electrons, At this point, equal to the intrinsic concentration, we, we say that the, the device is entering the inversion region. Okay? Let's calculate here the, this potential, this phi s is phi t times, and this is called the Fermi potential. And the surface potential equals phi t times the natural log of Na over Ni. You have the Fermi potential. What's the meaning of the Fermi potential? It's the surface potential such, mean, such that T equals N equals Ni at the interface with the oxide. These blue balls here are the electrons. These yellow balls are ions. Okay. So now you have uh, two types of negative charge: the ions and the electrons. Why should we separate these two types of charge? Because this yellow charge don't contribute to the current. They cannot contribute to the current. But they are essential to calculate the Poisson's equation. And also the capacitive effects in the transistor. Because when you change the gate voltage, you change both the electron charge and the ion charge. So these two Charge represent capacitive effects as well. Okay. May I, I move to the next slide? Okay. Let's increase the potential. Okay. Something like this will happen if you increase the potential. At some point, 
or at some voltage, at some gate voltage, the electron concentration will be greater than the whole concentration in the substrate. Okay. From this value up to the higher values of the electron concentration, we call this region the strong inversion region. So you have now another region to define the strong inversion region. It starts to occur when n equal to n a n s n h x equals zero. Now, if you replace the value of n in this equation, you will find that find that. Phi S equals to Phi S. We just include here NA. It has NA squared over NA squared, and you find that Phi S equals to Phi S. Okay? Okay. So, if n equals n i, it's the beginning of the inversion. Mm -hmm. If n equals n a, you have the beginning of strong inversion. I would say that if n is from n i to n a, you have weak inversion. It's a first definition of weak inversion and strong inversion. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first model of the MOSFET was defined for strong inversion. This is the quadratic model that I showed you before. And another model in the weak inversion, which is an exponential, an exponential model, <coughs> was described in, in, 19, in 1978 or something by a Swiss team. By a very famous professor of the PFL, which is called Eric Hitto. I suppose he's still active. Maybe he's in the he's eight, 85 or 86 years old. I suppose he's alive. I hope he is. Okay. Okay. In strong inversion, the concentration of what were minority carriers becomes majority carriers. They have a concentration. At the interface, which is also this time the, the acceptor concentration substrate. Okay, this is a summary of what we have seen. Okay. So this is the MOS cap. So this is the vertical axis. The accumulation. The concentration of holes close to the interface is greater than the concentration in the substrate. The concentration of the electron is reduced. See that this is for a negative voltage. For a negative voltage in the gate, holes are attracted and electrons are sent away. So you have a picture like this. Now, if VGB is greater than zero, the, the, positive, oh, the positive voltage at the gate repels the holes, which are positive charged and attract electrons. 
what the amount of electrons that are attracted are is very small in this case. If you keep increasing the gate voltage, what happens? Something like this. The electron concentration increases and the whole concentration increases. Okay. And finally, in the strong divergent region, the concentration of electrons close to the interface is greater than the gate, and the concentration of both decreases a lot. Okay. So this is a semi-quantitative picture of what happens in the MOS capacitor. This is very important to understand the behavior of the MOS transistor, which will be, I don't know, if, I suppose I have to, to finish this. 10, 5, 5, I have, suppose, maybe the students have classes now, I don't know. Questions? Comments? Which are the benefits of this uh, DC model instead of the model we have seen in our graduate courses? Okay. The model of the, your graduate course is not general. Mm -hmm. Just for, say, not low current, mm -hmm. but in most or in many applications, you need a model which covers regions. Even in a digital circuit, let's suppose that you have an inverter, you have studied inverter right now. You have a PMOS and an NMOS device. Even in, when you suppose that the transistor is in, in cut off, say, input level is high, so the, the, PMOS, the PMOS transistor is off. But it's not really off. You need, say, Oh, this area, ah, the current is one femtoampere. Oh, this is nothing. But in a processor, you have a one billion transistor. Oh, so multiply this by one billion and you have okay. milliamps or amps. Mm -hmm. So you need a better model. Okay. Even for digital, you, you cannot use just the, okay? But for, at the very beginning, oh, it was a useful model, but it didn't represent all the voltage range for the transistor operation. So okay. you always need a com you almost always need a complete model. Mm -hmm. In some cases that I have designed, you don't need the model for strong inversion, for example, the model that you study mm -hmm. in, in the undergrad course. Mm -hmm. But in general, I, I will need all the regions. Okay. Okay. So, uh, it's important to have yeah. a, a, a complete model for all regions. BSIM is for all regions. Okay. And I, I think that the textbooks like Sedran, Jagger, um, Sarasari, they should change this, the equation for the, the MOS set. Because even the, for graduate students, you should um, say, you, you should know that the, there is something beyond the classical. Yeah. Okay. The, the classical transistor mod was developed, I don't remember exactly, 1968. It's called the Shishman Hodges model. Okay, but which describes the transistor in terms of quadratic equations that you study. Okay, and this, also this model has some defects such as oh the transistor is not symmetrical, you have to change the threshold voltage in order to include the, some effects, let's say, which is the effect of the bulk chart. So Let's move to another concept, another, uh, say, complete model for all regions. Okay, thank you for very much. Tomorrow, 